If man doesn't take up his sovereign duty, then a kick up the arse is the only thing that will do it. So you could look at these people that if we didn't have some sort of adversarial aspect in our lives, and I don't even mean on the higher level of the fractal, even in the most interpersonal and domestic situation, we'd be looking for our surfboard and, and just having a ball. And, and then again, you, you become a flat liner in your consciousness. You know, I don't need to be Schopenhauer to tell you that, you know, without suffering, life has no meaning. And we can argue that point to the nth degree, but unbelievably, it's a fact. Because the unconsciousness and the vacuity and the delinquency that you see, as you say, is partly responsible for that. That we have so much affluence provided by the, the masters, because they know that, you know, chains of gold work just as good to enslave the slave as chains of iron. And that's the only thing that's changed over the centuries of the history, although they're not incapable of taking more sterner measures, as, as the gentleman at the end pointed out about, you know, Leo, uh, uh, all around the world, they're still doing that. But the point, the spiritual aspect of it is, of course, if you are doing your soul work without the, the uh, catabolic source, right, if you don't need it, and you're doing your soul work, then the adversarial energy will be less around you because you're doing your homework of your own time, which I assume people here are doing. For the rest of mankind who are negating that, they're living in absence of being, then nature, the spirit that is, will provide the adversary in exactly the same way the body does it by producing disease. So the disease that's in the body politic is, is no different a pathogen. And I've said umpteen times about the whole idea that the, even the ego is the grave that rose you know, from the grave of the self. And that if you see maggots around, you know, if, you, if you leave meat out for X amount of time, expect maggots. If you, you know, have sewage and you don't clean it up, expect rats. So it is by the negation of man's selfhood, his being, or what religious people would call the soul, and basically negating all of that, that I believe that these pathogenic forces have arisen, and these tyrannies have arisen. And the original question was, how do we live with it, you know, while it's happening under that form of tyranny? One is realize you're the origin of it, individually. Two is realize you're never going to change it unless you have the education. Before the enlightenment and the revelation, you must start with the education. And that's what this level of work, you know, what we're doing here, is all about, and the collaboration that goes with that. So the education is also fundamentally important, so that the doctor knows if the, if the, if the complaint is of the heart, don't be, you know, you know, fixing the brain. Be able to identify the problem, first of all, diagnose it, and that takes a certain level of expertise and education. And that's what this is all about. And then you can treat the right disease with the right cure. You know? So it's a multiplicity of different uh, aspects, but it's a very important question. Do we really have a better quality of life just because we live longer and are richer? Any answers? No, I don't think we do. Excuse me. Yeah, I don't. Th it's all. About, first of all, it's relative. If you grow up in Calcutta, yeah, the answer is yes. You know, if you grow up in Biafra, right? then the answer is yes. So it's all relative. And ultimately, it's not what you have, it's the way you relate to what you have. Right? The finest men and the freest men have been in dungeons, lived in dungeons most of their life. But here, attitudinally, they were free and enlightened souls. So what you have is almost immaterial. You can live in the most decadent and affluent societies and still be absolutely in your center and a true person. You know? Or you could live in the most hideous situations. I mean, war-torn, families murdered, and still be absolutely in touch with what is real. So it's about the way that you do things, not so much the what of what you have and, and all of that. In the earliest settlers of Ireland, in the very primordial times, the High King, whose name can be pronounced in a variety of ways, we pronounce it Nada, um, his sword you know, a sword is a very distinctive thing. So it's quite easy to trace these swords of power. And his sword was called Retaliator. And it was picked up in fiction because they say in the legends of ancient Ireland, they talk about this, that this sword had the power to vibrate in the presence of evil. Mm. And if it ever left the king's side, only then he could be killed, etc., etc., etc. Or, or that the sword also gave him the power to fight in a pan-dimensional capacity as well or in other dimensions, as long as he had the sword. He was king, and he also was protected, and he also could fight all sorts of unseen enemies. And that sword was called Retaliator, and I personally believe that was one of the prototypes of, uh, of Excalibur. But the sword is very, very important in, in this primordial megalithic tradition of Ireland because the actual suits of the tarot, which also include a sword, right? The sword, the, the uh, pentacle, and the wand, and the cup, 
are found in the earliest myths of, Le of, of Ireland. They're part of the 13 wider treasures of Britain, but they're known as the four treasures of Ireland, and they're identical to the tarot suits. It's the earliest, way before Egypt, it's the earliest uh, reference to anything that would be those suits, and of course the sword was one of those suits. But one other little point about this conjecture thing, that, and the idea of romance, that was the little bit of conflict here. So much information has been hidden. Like you said, the man turned the stone the other way around, so, you know, something would happen. Well, uh, the base stones of the, of the Brook and the Boyne, right, at Newgrange, have all been deliberately turned face in, so people can't see the pictographs and hieroglyphics there. And that's just an example I'm giving you of the fact that the establishment has hidden so much factual information where none of us would have to have conferences like this. It would be a no-brainer what's going on in the world. Conjecture is that sort of Conan Doyle way of jumping the gap. That, that's what we have to make do with. You have to be imaginative. You have to be, the conjecture is what we now have to build the bridge between the beads that are all over the floor and no thread. So never doubt your imagination or your intuition at all because yeah, it would be a perfect world, wouldn't it, if no information was ever concealed from us and we could just go to absolute factual information. Unfortunately, we can't do that, so then we have to fall in love with that other realm of intelligence, that ancestral reservoir which children, of course, have until it's knocked out of them. And we need to recalibrate that because although it may be less format formal and less organized than what we laughingly call fact half the time, it still can serve the same purpose. And we are, again, as part of the earlier question about what can we do, is linking back to that ancestral flow of intelligence and whatever you can do, whatever it is for you, through music, through dance, through yoga, through whatever, is to get in touch again with that um, organic flow of intelligence and then you will be beyond even the realm of what other people might need as fact and so on you will have your knowledge you'll have your knowing which is a totally different thing as the gentleman you know uh, was showing yesterday about the difference between that feminine knowing the ancestral knowledge and then the other thing which is the masculine paradigm of having to have the facts and then the consensus and all of that you know peer review uh, you know stuff Well, you and me are Irish, so we're habitually pessimistic about tomorrow, but optimistic about the day after tomorrow. <laughs> so that's the answer. And <laughs> I think, but to be more serious about it, oh, by God, if, if consciousness is left at the door, which I tend to think is happening, yes, then, you know, we have to be realists and go, uh, you know. But at the same time, there is a turning of the tide now where consciousness and the understanding of our personal responsibility in all of this and not finger pointing, it's them, it's, you know, it's over the hill. If we can turn that corner, uh, then, oh, then the whole game changes. This was pointed out in talk, uh, Professor Tolkien's Lord of the Rings in which the most insignificant, smallest, lowest level of society has the biggest effect. It can do things that powerful wizards cannot do. Right? And if it was good enough for Professor Tolkien to believe in that, it's all right for the rest of us to believe in that. They can't win because I've all said in my other metaphysical work, evil contains within it the seeds of its own destruction. And one really needs to meditate on that deeply and also see it applied in your own life with the tossers that surround us and the other evil injustices that are done even in, you know, in plain view. Watch that experience. Watch what happens to a person that becomes, who's evil and ruthless and negative. Just observe it. And you'll notice that this is in fact a case, and it's certainly the case up the fractal. Evil contains within it the seed of its own destruction. The moment that you take that kind of anti-human negative stance, you're just waving a red flag to nature, go come and get me, which is exactly what's happening now. It's called the age of revealing and the age of awakening. All the message that somebody like me can give is, can you please get into the spirit of that? Because it's happening anyway. And you can either get into sync with it, or you can just sit there and be smashed when you know, the river takes a turn. Your boat will, your ego boat, Right, will be smashed. Can you let go of the shores, like the Hopi prophecy says? Can you let go of the oars and go with that flow? Because it's a very dynamic flow, and it will handle it. What happens with us is that we think, oh my God, what's little old me going to do? It's really difficult, you know? And, and then and it becomes like you're suddenly taking it personally, as if your ego is going to be able to run out there like in the old days, you know, grab a sword and do something about it. We have no capacity in that, in that realm. It's, it's a mixture between tremendous responsibility and self-awareness of it, but at the same time, the ability to as Neil was saying, go yin, let go and let the higher force guide you because without that guidance, you're pottering around is like a, you know, a kid with a giant sword you know, uh, playing games. A higher form of guidance and a higher form of strategy takes care of this. It doesn't mean abnegate your responsibility, 
but it means try to always remain with your head in the clouds but your feet on the ground. This is both a physical war, but it's also a psychic one. And the guidance that comes to you is the most important thing, and it will show you where to go and what to do about it. And that kind of particular guidance I'm talking about is not the same kind of sorcery that the Black Lodge has. They have high intelligence, and they have come tremendous human knowledge about us on the most fundamental levels. But they lack that connection to the higher intelligence, and that's their ultimate downfall, together with what I said about evil having the seeds of destruction within it. You choose that road, and you will be terminal. You choose the organic, living, feminine you know, flow of the Tao, and no matter what tyrannies exist in the world, no matter how things get bleak, even if things got ten times as bleak as they are now, worse, like a prison planet, really and truly, as long as you're with that flow, you're in your center, and it's, it, it doesn't matter, you see. So it's all about where you are, and they, they can't inhabit that place, which is why they want dominion right, over the world. If you can't rise yourself, what's the next best thing? Push everybody down. You're actually remaining exactly where you are, but you've done a good job, like the teachers and bosses we have to deal with every day. They're going to you know, push, push you down, and then they feel mighty high. Well, that's what the Bushes and Obamas and the Stalins and all do. They cannot rise themselves, and we have to understand this. They're static spiritually. And the moment that you start doing your spiritual homework, you know, the moment that you do your spiritual homework, you are, in a, you, know, you are then on the road to victory. That's the basic way I see it. Say a few words about it. I showed a clip the other day about the collectivism. You know, it was a logo, a comp corporate logo, in which person's sense of identity is entirely based on the social persona. So this is where the, the, the Black Lodge wants us to be, where you have, or let's put it this way, any sense of self that you do have is basically a collectivized sense of self. That's the herd. They've already done, you, you're already doing the work for them then. You know, and, and they don't need to do anything more except impose you know, the chains of gold upon you if you are not able to really connect with what it is that makes you unique. We all know what it is that makes us the same as everybody else. Our names, our philosophies, even the work that we do. You say you're a taxi driver. Well, 10,000 people can say that. You know, what makes you really real? If you stood up and said, well, I'm the man who cares about being, I'm the man who cares about meaning, how many will say that, as Nietzsche and Heidegger and these people have said? But the rest of us goes, well, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I paint the walls or uh, you know, I, I drive a bus. There's an inauthenticity implicit in that collective herd and a stepping out of that into your individuality, uh, knowing who your enemy is on the physical level, you know, and realizing what they're really about. They're not really about imprisoning you. Somebody talked about affluence earlier. That's right, they don't mind giving you all the affluence. That's not the problem. Their problem is control of your mind and the dumbing down of your individuality. That's where the prison lies. It's an internal psychic one. And the only way for you to handle that is to do what you need to do from your inner self, right? That's uh, absolutely know thyself. And a, a point will come where you will have to then differentiate yourself from every other creature on the face of this earth. Maybe not the animals, because that was spoken of in other lectures about asking the animals for their power, you know, to, to lend. Let's not even go there. From the human point of view, it may come to the point where you have so transcended them, the mass, the herd, the dasman, that yes, you feel that you stand alone in the world. Now, do you know why so few people take this road? It's because that's very hard and painful to do. Right? The road to selfhood is very difficult. The question we asked were, uh, if you could take on the karmic responsibility of the Illuminati, would you do it? And if so, are you doing it? We're already doing it. Karma is nothing more than ignorance. Dharma is knowledge. Dharma is awareness, right? Ignorance is what they're in. They're in a form of ignorance. Like I said, they've chosen a road, and ultimately, metaphysically speaking, that's a road of ignorance. By sharing the ignorance or being under the force, <laughs> under their dominion in any sense of the term, right, which is ultimately meaning that you, you believe everything they're saying and you don't think for yourself, then you are in a state of karma as worse uh, than theirs or whatever. You can't measure it. It's ignorance is ignorance, regardless if it's on a massive scale, right, of Big Brother or on your individual scale. You know, the time has come now, though, for the human race to wake up and grow up. And that come, there's a sovereignty and individuality in, involved in that. Let's go with it. Let's enjoy it. Let's be grateful for the fact. You know, raise a glass of wine in your garden and celebrate the fact that now has come the final time, either because of the affluence, either because of the historical period we're in, or because the tyrants have changed their tactics, whatever. All of that is pertinent. But the same fact remains that some other historical action is taking place, in which the world now, through the internet and through whatever, is getting this kind of information. Celebrate that. Be very grateful for that. And at the same time, always, always, always congratulate yourself for have coming as far as you do. It will negate the pessimism that you may have, you know, and it will really give you enthusiasm to carry on in the future. One chink in the armor of this, one new revelation, of which there will be many more, 
it just makes you wonder what has been done in the name of this preposterous lunacy. It makes you weep. It makes me weep. This is, I take this very seriously. And I think very deeply about the crimes that have been done in the name of this palaver and this nonsense, you see. So I'm, I'm looking at that. I think if, if, if these revelations from Ralph or anybody else can insist in any way to the healing of what has been done, because we, we carry within our race memory, you see, the scars of every human being that's lived on this planet and everything they've had to endure. It's right in you. It's just that we have a you know, circuitry that blocks that. It's called the ego, and we should thank the ego for that ability because we'd be drowned in sorrow if we had to face what has gone on. And I hope that Leo's talk has, you know, for people who may be new to this, and if you get his book and you'll see what the horrors that have been done in this, never forget that. Because we are the harbingers. We are the, we are the descendants of those people who cried in the mines and the factories and the fields. Why, why, why? Each individual here carries that weight because your ancestors died miserable deaths, children in the mines not far away from here, right? On the fields of war, for instance. And in their psyche, they asked, why, why, why? And you are to provide the answer. So even if there's not a humanitarian shred in anybody sitting here, and I hope there is, but just imagine for a moment that you have no hum real concern about other human beings. Have at least concern then for your own lineage, your own heredity, your own past, and the forefathers, the uncles, and the ancestors, and the grandparents who died hideous deaths for nothing in wars to keep these tyrants in their place. And the answers that you discover in this life, you're answering their call. So never forget that.